Recent protests in downtown today erupted into rioting and looting as demonstrators clashed with the police at the barricades along the designated protest route. Downtown businesses are being ransacked as we speak. Liberal Dog, what can you tell us about tonight's events? Thank you, Newsrad. Now, let me be clear. This rioting is not, I repeat, not a part of the protest. We've seen this happen again and again. These are outside agitators. They are spoiled suburban white anarchists from out of town taking advantage of the chaos and making the real protesters look bad. They do not stand with the protesters. They only encourage a crackdown by the police. Now wait one doggone minute there, you liberal commie loon. Ah, yes. Conservative dog, you'd like to add something? Yes, I would. Now, I may totally agree with Liberal Dog that the Antifa rioters are a bunch of out-of-town spoiled brats brainwashed into hating America by their commie university professors. But I completely disagree with this narrative that they are not a part of the protests. Liberal cities all over the country are burning, and it is all due to woke commies and the degenerate thugs they deployed onto our city streets in order to destroy Western civilization. Furthermore, I think- Hey, wait a minute, guys. I'm getting word that we have someone out there on the streets who would like to give us their two cents on tonight's events. Hey, um, hi, hello? Uh, Newsrad and, um, liberal dog and conservative dog. You guys are all, well, you're all talking out of your butts. Um, actually, technically, we don't have. You've got me all wrong. Now, I can't speak for everyone here at the protest, of course, but I know that I am not an outside agitator or like an agent provocateur or anything like that. I am just a protester. And maybe I have. And now this is not a confession, all right? This is not legally binding what I'm about to say, but I may have allegedly in Roblox or maybe in state of emergency, I may have dabbled in a little rioting and looting. He admits it. I disavow, I disavow. But hey, that's to be expected, right? I mean, let's be honest, attacks on private property, they get at the heart of attacking this corrupt system. In fact, the United States has a rich history of rioting and looting as a political act. Actually, you know what, while I have you all here, let me tell you about... Hey, I know you. You're that jaywalking punk anarchist. In Defense of Looting, A Riotous History of Uncivil Action by Vicki Osterweil, Bold Type Books, 2020. The key point of this text is to push back against the common misconceptions around looting. You know, misconceptions like what we saw enumerated in the intro just now. That looting is committed by outside agitators who are not part of the protest, that it is ineffective, and all that. Before we get into it, let's define what is meant by the term looting. As Osterweil explained in an interview with NPR, when I use the word looting, I mean the mass expropriation of property, mass shoplifting during a moment of upheaval or riot. That is the thing I'm defending. I'm not defending any situation in which property is stolen by force. This is not a home invasion either. It is about a certain kind of action that is taken during protests and riots. I would go further and clarify that stealing is about taking someone's personal belongings, where looting is about taking commodities. Like, stealing is taking someone's car out of their driveway, where looting would be taking a car from a car lot in the middle of a riot. Stealing is taking someone's TV out of their living room, where looting would be taking some TVs out of a big box store during a riot. Walmart getting to have all of its shit, getting to keep that shit without that shit being stolen, creates more harm in the world and to innocent people, specifically to Walmart workers, than the act of stealing it ever could. Walmart, or any of these companies, got rich in the first place by stealing from all of us, and then using that stolen wealth to further manipulate state legislators into letting them exploit and rob us even harder. Does that distinction make sense? Moving along, judging by the book's title and subtitle, I see that this text has two goals. One, this book wants to defend looting, obviously. Specifically, defend looting as a political tactic. Maybe convince some radical activists of this, or maybe even some liberals, or maybe, maybe even convince some conservatives that looting is a defensible political act. And two, this book wants to put looting in its proper historical context by giving a riotous history of it. Putting on my thinking cap, I'm guessing that this text will say something about how looting was integral to American independence. You know, like the Boston Tea Party comes to mind. And that it was also integral to ending slavery, what with slaves looting themselves by running away. Then there's Shay's Rebellion, where poor farmers looted weapons from an armory in order to resist the foreclosure of their farms. 
There was the looting of the civil rights movement where black folks looted the goods and services denied to them by Jim Crow laws. There's the radical labor movement in which workers took back the fruits of their labor through looting and sabotage. And we have modern instances of looting as well, such as the LA riots, the WTO riots, the BLM riots, fighting against capitalist inequality, systemic racism, and police oppression. Basically, I suspect this text will draw a thread from the political looting of the past and connect it to today with black bloc anarchists and Antifa and BLM protesters engaging in political looting in our modern age. So let's hear out this defense of looting and take a look at this thread in depth, starting with chapter one, the racial roots of property. Taking us back to the foundations of the United States, Oscar Wilde explains that the US economy, that US capitalism was built on two pillars, indigenous genocide and African slavery. Indigenous genocide to clear the land of its inhabitants and convert it into a virgin garden of Eden and African slaves to turn that empty Eden into profitable industry for the wealthy and powerful in society. Slaves built America. Slaves, this is your song. Thank you. Slave. As Osterweil puts it, property, state, government, and economy in America rise from these pillars of racialized dispossession and violence, slavery, and genocide. And any change made that does not upend this history, that does not tear these pillars to the ground in a process of decolonization and reparations, does not deserve the name justice. These are the radical demands for change from which Osterweil will be justifying looting as a means of achieving those demands. Getting to the racial roots of property of the chapter's title, Osterweil explains that the enlightenment values of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness through property ownership racialized property ownership and human value in the United States. She states, to be able to own property is to be human. So those who cannot own property, be they enslaved, indigenous, or even the children and wives of settlers, need not be recognized as fully human by the state. And through this calculation, whiteness became the meta property from which all other private property flows and is derived. But what if someone were to disagree with this calculation? What if someone refused to be the property of someone else? Well, that takes us to chapter two, looting emancipation. Osterweil starts by arguing that the African-Americans who escaped slavery caused the greatest attack on private property in US history, that they stole themselves from their masters and in so doing abolished a huge percentage of America's wealth. Like we often tell the story like Abraham Lincoln and the Union Kiss Army ended chattel slavery in the United States, and they certainly helped, but ultimately it was resistance from the enslaved themselves which made abolition possible, or even inevitable? Now, the destruction of chattel slavery didn't come about because a few slaves looted themselves, but because runaway slaves had become a massive cost to the system of slavery. You see, a few runaway slaves spread out over the entire slave system would actually benefit that system. Sure, some small farms might go under, but that just allows for consolidation of power and land for larger plantations who can survive a few runaway slaves, buy up their competition, and benefit from the release of pressure on that system that those small acts of resistance create. The slaves looting themselves needed to reach a system destabilizing scale. And we see a similar calculation today. Small scale rioting and looting might hurt both a chain store and a small business in an area, but the chain store can absorb the cost through insurance and profits from other stores outside the impacted area and stuff like that, while the small competitor goes out of business, consolidating power and letting the victims of the system let off some steam, but protecting the overall system as a result. Politically effective looting can't just let off steam. Instead, it must increase in severity and cost to the system. The cost paid by the system through this resistance must outweigh the cost of staying the course. In this way, the system either folds to the demands of those resisting it, or it collapses. Here's how that worked with slavery in the United States. The increase of runaway slaves throughout the early 1800s culminated in the need for the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, which required runaway slaves to be returned to their owners even if they fled to states which didn't recognize slavery. This required the people in free states to participate in laws that they didn't recognize and gave slave catchers authority in northern states outside their jurisdiction. These moves were made to desperately maintain the system of slavery in the face of increasing numbers of slaves looting themselves. And this ultimately created the destabilizing chaos which led to the end of chattel slavery in the United States. And this was some serious system destabilizing looting. 
As Osterweil explains, the value of human property in 1860 was $3 billion, which was equivalent to about two-thirds of the GDP. An equivalent percentage of GDP today would be about $14 trillion, all of it abolished in a span of four years. But of course, the system can't just let people loot things, or themselves, willy-nilly. There needs to be some sort of armed apparatus to protect the concepts of private property and commodities in society. Which brings us to Chapter 3, All Cops Are Bastards. This chapter is about the history of the police. No, not Sting's old band, the actual police department, with cops. You know the story. Starting as colonial guards and slave patrols protecting the property of the rich and powerful from riots and looting and strikes, over time these violent repressive forces honed their craft and evolved into the modern police we know and love today. We've talked about this history a few times on this channel with books like The New Jim Crow, Loaded, and The End of Policing. Osterweil starts this story with the unpaid and unarmed patrolling night watch of the Middle Ages. Aw, look at them. Aww. So quaint. But then, with the Enclosure Acts, which forced poor peasants off of the land and made them homeless vagrants, and with vagrancy laws, which criminalized being a homeless vagrant, the unarmed night watch wasn't enough to maintain social order and property relations in society. And so, more official methods of policing were required. And as industrialization turned medieval towns into cities and concentrations of impoverished populations became even more difficult to police, law enforcement began adopting the tactics colonial guards used abroad to repress and control colonized populations. According to Osterweil, the U.S. took this one step further with the advent of armed slave patrols in the South, with the North adopting many of these practices as well for protecting property owners from strikes and race riots and all kinds of unrest that gripped the North, what with industrial revolution tensions between capital and labor and black folks fleeing slavery, butting heads with new immigrants from Europe and local workers all through the 1800s. As Osterweil puts it, in all instances, the police developed as a formal governmental organization when the enslaver, colonizer, and or capitalist could no longer sufficiently protect their property or control on their own the crowds of laborers they required. But after the U.S. Civil War and the end of chattel slavery and the end of needing slave patrols, it looked like things were going to turn around for the better. What with the Reconstruction Era ushering in child labor laws and public education and property rights for women and things like that. And there were cool little radical enclaves forming as well, like you might have seen in that movie The Free State of Jones. Yep, social change was in the air. Chapter 4, White Riot. All that positive change was destroyed through the purging of black politicians and the introduction of black codes and Jim Crow laws, causing a reactionary destruction of the Reconstruction era. Osterweil explains that lynching was the main form of racist terror immediately after Reconstruction, peaking in the 1890s. But after that time, rioting became the primary method of racist terror, peaking in 1919, what is called the Red Summer. Okay, well, that sucks and all, but this book is about celebrating looting as a political act. So, like, race riots are based in looting pill, right? Well, as Osterweil explains it, when people of color loot a store, they are taking back a minuscule portion of what has been historically stolen from them, from their ancestral history and language to the basic safety of their children on the street today. White supremacist race riots, on the other paw, tend to feature significantly more personal violence than they do attacks on property, more property destruction than looting. And when looting occurs, these white rioters tend to target people's homes and persons. Now, I don't like this... When people of color loot a store, they are taking back a minuscule portion of what has been historically stolen from them argument. I think justifying violence and property destruction by vaguely alluding to crimes of the past could easily land us justifying all kinds of horrible crap that we shouldn't be holding water for. But I do think it's a solid argument to say that a just riot involves the destruction and looting of commodities and government property, whereas unjust rioting involves going after civilians and their homes and their personal effects. Thus, radical rioting and looting against the system is cool and looting-pilled, while reactionary destruction of people's possessions to uphold an unjust system is not cool. Let's get back to the history. So, over time, after Reconstruction, lynching was out and race riots were in, and Osterwild, of course, gives a detailed look at the Tulsa riots, also known as the burning of Black Wall Street. However, she comes to some conclusions you might not expect. Let's start at the beginning. 
The riots were kicked off when the Tulsa Tribune had a headline reading, To Lynch Negro Tonight, and the black revolutionary group African Blood Brotherhood pledged to stop the lynching. The story, as Osterweil tells it, is that 2,000 white people formed a lynch mob at the jail, and around 100 black men arrived with guns to protect the jail from being stormed by the mob. It's unknown who fired the first shot, but a gunfight ensued, leaving 10 white mob members dead and two black anti-lynching protesters dead. This kicked off gun battles across Tulsa, and Osterweil states, they set black businesses and buildings aflame, destroying much of the commercial main street and surrounding residential district, looting and burning houses and stores alike. The police, of course, worked through the night and the morning to disarm, round up, and jail any and all black people they could find. After the riot, there wasn't another lynching in Tulsa County for seven decades. Only in the current era of police lynching has public white supremacist murder returned to Tulsa. So yeah, did that last bit catch you off guard? After the riot, there wasn't another lynching in Tulsa County for seven decades? Is Osterwald trying to say that armed resistance to a racist lynch mob put a stop to lynching in Tulsa? Well, Osterwald argues that this story has two interpretations. One that tells of a white town destroying the black American dream, another that recognizes black armed organizers saving a man from lynching and fighting back against a murderous white lynch mob. The former narrative emphasizes the black community as eternally suffering, peaceful victims of white supremacist violence. The other, as an oppressed people organizing and defending themselves, fighting for their lives. Now, which interpretation is accurate? Osterweil concludes that both narratives are overly simplistic. The truth is probably some messy combination of the two. Chapter 5. Looted Bread, Stolen Labor this chapter is about the spontaneous direct action of the radical labor movement at the beginning of the Second Industrial Revolution and how that was absorbed and pacified by unionization, political parties, and federal programs. We often think of organizations as keeping people active. The NAACP, SLAC, SDS, DSA, SPA, SRA, ATF, ATM, CUM, ASS, nope, wait, scratch those last few. Basically, unions, political groups and clubs on college campuses, committees and local governments or whatever, those make folks capable of forming movements and using their political power to get things done. But Osterweil counters that the history of looting and the riots in which it occurs is also often a history of disorganization. And she expands on this, stating, The logic of formal organizational power, no matter how noble or radical the organization's goals, will in crisis lead it to preserve itself for the next fight, rather than abandoning it all for this one. But the organization that is preserved is one that, at the height of the people's power, turned its back on them. Basically, if we restrict our concept of political action to organized unions and political parties and charity groups and the like, then we won't have the spontaneity of folks taking the destruction of the system into their own hands. We won't see rioting and looting. Osterwald starts this story of the pacification of radical labor by discussing the Great Unrest of 1877. The Great Unrest of 1877 was a series of massive railroad strikes in Virginia which spread into massive looting as rail cars were overturned and destroyed. As Osterweil explains it, This disorganized assembly managed commerce in the city, halted all railroad traffic, and requisitioned food for strikers, whose numbers encompassed more than a dozen professionals outside of the rails, constituting an almost total general strike. She explains that this radical labor movement kicked off the country's first Red Scare, a spike in race riots, anti-communist and anti-black violence, and the return of the KKK. It was a pretty hectic time. And this radical labor movement was crushed in a variety of ways. You have company thugs of the National Guard beating up and killing strikers. You have the adoption of business-friendly unionism and the introduction of federal programs such as the New Deal taking the wind out of the movement's sails. It's a story we talked about when discussing the rise and repression of radical labor. Basically, as official channels of political organization grew, the disorganized grassroots spontaneity and direct action, such as the Great Unrest of 1877, was kind of done for. Labor leaders and political organizations had come to speak on behalf of the people, and they did not see rioting and looting as justifiable political acts. And Osterweil concludes, Organizers' visions of what an actual political organization looked like played straight into the hands of liberal recuperation, and what temporary gains the movement achieved with direct action were misunderstood by organizers as the sign to form a real movement. 
In doing so, they repressed the direct actions, leaving those gains vulnerable to immediate cutbacks as local power collapsed. By centering looting and seeing its frequent sidelining, rejection, or even repression by the organizers, historians, and bureaucrats of the labor movement, I hope we can begin to shake loose certain concepts of what revolutionary activity can and must look like to succeed. Now, before moving on, I want to address what we've covered so far. We've had basically four chapters detailing America's racist history and looting in relation to it. That access to property and who can be property was divided on racial lines. That runaway slaves looted their freedom. That cops have a racist history in the slave patrols. That radical self-defense helped stave off racist violence post-Reconstruction. Basically preparing to draw a thread from runaway slaves to the looting during the BLM protests. Which makes sense since the BLM protests inspired the writing of this book. And that's all well and good. I, I like it. But if race was going to be the overall focus, I think that gets us away from a defense of looting as a political act in general. The chapter we just covered touched on the labor stuff, like the great unrest of 1877, and that's great. But the labor movement involves a lot more looting than that. And in the same way that Osterwald draws a thread from slavery to civil rights to BLM, I would have liked to see a thread drawn from Shays' Rebellion and Coxey's Army to the radical labor movement to the anti-globalization movement and anti-capitalist movements of the last few decades. But no such luck. Anyways, moving on. Chapter 6. No Such Thing as Nonviolence Now wait a minute there. What do you mean no such thing as nonviolence? Didn't you pay any attention in school? Did you ever hear about Martin Luther King Jr. or Gandhi or... Others? What about them, huh? Well, Osterwald argues that there was no overall principled nonviolent movement, that nonviolence was always only a tactical consideration. Not only this, but the biggest proponents of nonviolence during the civil rights movement were protected by armed guards, such as the deacons of defense. So attempting to separate rioting from the civil rights movement is inaccurate. She states, Rioting and looting were not accidental offshoots of the black freedom movement not some opportunistic or tragic consequence of civil rights struggle. Instead, they formed a central part of the movement's power and effectiveness, and a core experience of the movement for many of those who rose up against white supremacy. Following our trip through U.S. history, we leave behind the lynch mobs of the Reconstruction era and the race riots of the World War I era, and move on to the era of the Night Riders. Night Riders were small groups of concerned citizens, aka racist white people, who drove through black neighborhoods at night and fired guns into and threw bombs into black people's homes or kidnapped people, stuff like that. And Osterwild ends the chapter concluding, Massive resistance, supported by the state and vigilante alike, proved to be an effective block to nonviolent integration struggles. With no recourse to the courts or the police, and with the ever-present threat of the Klansmen and the Night Riders, black folks in the South did what they had been doing since the Civil War. They armed themselves. Chapter 7, Using Guns Nonviolently. This chapter is about the last decades of the Civil Rights Movement and the nonviolent tactics of it. Osterweil argues that nonviolence can be an effective tactic. For example, when images of students being beaten, spat on, and arrested for sitting on a stool spread nationwide and did exactly what nonviolent tactics are meant to do, galvanize anger, support, resistance, and pity. These nonviolent tactics are most effective when exacerbated by disorganized and out-of-control police, sicking dogs on people and spraying them with fire hoses and all that stuff that you probably saw photographed in a U.S. history textbook, or on the news during the height of the BLM protests. Osterweil argues that nonviolence gave the early civil rights movement the legitimacy it required to receive support from northern liberals. Money from liberals kept organizers in the field, while white media coverage kept national attention on the struggle. Nonviolence gave black folks moral room to maneuver in a country that had always a priori viewed them as criminal and immoral. Yes, in a lot of ways, the tactical use of nonviolence worked, but it wasn't without its flaws. For example, nonviolence had an over reliance on the power and willingness of white liberals in the North to push for change. And over time, nonviolence started to become an obligatory ethical principle rather than a strategic tactic. And let's acknowledge the fact that nonviolence is a nebulous qualification. Is standing as an armed guard violent or nonviolent? What about smashing a window or blocking a street? 
Perhaps Oscar Wilde's most important critique of nonviolence is that, with time, the system inoculates itself against this tactic. Nonviolence worked in, like, the 40s and 50s when the cops were losing their shit and sicking dogs on people and stuff like that. But with time, they developed new strategies for dealing with protests. Improved communications equipment, crowd control tactics and devices, official protests having start times and stop times and permits and marching routes, police making preemptive arrests and confiscating food and water and protest signs ahead of a demonstration, things like that. And Ostrawa concludes that nonviolence means outsourcing the power you need to meet your objectives to the police or the federal marshals. In other words, to the state. It means disavowing that power, not actually destroying it. When we remove the rioters and rebels from our image of the movement, we fundamentally misunderstand the nature of the struggle and ignore the open-minded perspectives and diverse tactics of its activists, who wanted, above all, to get free. The album by Dead Prez, of course. Chapter 8. Civil Riots Having covered the non-violence of the late civil rights movement, Osterwild now looks at the rioting of that era primarily from 1964 to 68. She argues that these riots were the most prolonged and successful attacks on white supremacy in the nation's history. That in the calls for justice and housing and employment and education that took place throughout the 70s, owe their success to that rioting. Giving a concrete example, she discusses the Watts riots in LA in 1965, which destroyed almost 300 buildings and over $300 million worth of property, adjusted for inflation. And Oswald explains that the Black Panther Party, the BPP members, took their uniform, black pants, leather jackets, and dark turtlenecks from Watts rioters. The Watts and other riots demonstrated to the BPP that the time was right for a revolutionary party, an organization with an explicitly not nonviolent philosophy, and one aimed toward total social transformation. This means that the revolutionary actions of the BPP, such as food banks and free breakfast programs and free clinics and all the rest were fueled by the fires of the Watts riot. And this gets to the kibble of Osterwald's argument. We had the history of runaway slaves causing the end of slavery, the massive rioting in the 60s leading to radical political actions such as the advent of the Black Panther Party. Well, let's keep that going. She then discusses the Newark riots of 1967, where six days of rioting resulted in some 350 buildings damaged and millions of dollars of merchandise destroyed or stolen. And like the Watts riots inspiring the BPP, the Newark riots helped create the Community for Unified Newark, CFUN. As Osterweil states, there is nothing riot-like about the activities or tactics of CFUN. Nevertheless, it was born as Newark Burn. She then discusses a riot in Detroit in 1967, where 1,300 buildings were destroyed and 2,700 businesses had been looted, which kicked off the Dodge Revolutionary Union movement. DRUM, a black revolutionary union movement within the auto industry. Although all this awesome radical political action was being fueled by the fires of rioting and looting, there were some setbacks for radical politics during this time. Che Guevara and Martin Luther King Jr. were killed, the revolution in the Congo was crushed, and things like that. At the same time, though, revolution seemed to be on the horizon. The Tet Offensive turned the Vietnam War in favor of the Vietnamese. The socialist president, Salvador Allende, was elected in Chile. The independence movement in Angola was going strong. Trans women of color were rioting for LGBT plus rights at Stonewall in New York. The American Indian movement, the Black Panther Party, the anti-war movement, the Brown Berets, the Young Lords, Asian Americans for Action, the Poor People's Movement, and all of that was going strong. And so we continue our trek through U.S. history. The 60s and early 70s came to a close, and the 80s were soon upon us. Americans, en masse, engaged in radical looting in every major city in the country. The general public stopped respecting the category of commodity. Capitalism was being dismantled. The government was overthrown, and Catalonia, Paris Commune, Rojava-style anarchist enclaves sprung up in every city in the nation. Or wait, that's not what happened. Osterwild states, the riots didn't come back. There were no more long, hot summers. Without the mass energy and intense threat to the state the riots posed, white retrenchment and reaction slowly retook control. Without increasing street action, the movements of the late 60s and 70s fell to repression, fizzled out, or devoured themselves through splits and infighting. Basically, you know the story. Neoliberalism, austerity, Reaganomics, Thatcherism, the war on drugs, the prison industrial complex, late-stage capitalism, and all that. 
And Osterweil insists that we must no longer fail to see the role that the rioting of the 60s and 70s played in movements for change. We must do away once and for all with the myth of nonviolence and with the false moral divisions between uprisings and social transformation, between insurrection and movement, between looting and boycotting, between rioting and community organization. Chapter 9, The Inhumanity of Looters Continuing along our journey through U.S. history, this chapter is about the rioting of the late 70s to the 2000s. Osterweil explains that after the 60s and 70s, rioting was no longer understood as a political act. Rather, neoliberalism saw rioting through an apolitical, individualistic lens. She states, The turn to moral and psychological explanations for unrest marks a transition to a frame that de-emphasizes systems and structures in favor of individual responsibility, family values, and culture. And she argues that the most clear example of this change in framing came in response to Hurricane Katrina. If you're not familiar with the story, basically, George Bush doesn't care about black people. Hey, whoa, whoa, let, let's not drag that guy into this, all right? <laughs> let's just say that George Bush's compassionate conservatism uh, was BS. Folks were left high and dry. Bye bye, Miss American Pie, drove my Chevy to the levee, and they broke and destroyed everyone's home. Whether someone was a thug taking advantage of the chaos of the hurricane to engage in some looting, or they were desperate survivors gathering supplies, well, that was at the discretion of the police and the vigilantes looking at them down the barrel of their gun. As Osterweil puts it, white vigilantes and police officers, stewing in the paranoia in the summer heat, responded with murder and mayhem. Constructing a narrative of lawless Katrina survivors justified the horrifying actions of police and white residents and enter stand your ground laws and the glorification of the rooftop Koreans and eventually folks like Kyle Rittenhouse and stuff and the when the looting starts, the shooting starts type rhetoric. And Osterwild concludes, from the NYC blackout to LA to Katrina, looting became the prototypical crime of the black, poor, and surplus, an act that immediately exiled its perpetrators from the human community and sentenced them to death an action that proved the righteousness of their disposability. Conclusion, out of the flames of Ferguson. Catching us up to just about modern day, Osterwild discusses the reactionary movements of the 2010s, such as the coups in Egypt and Turkey, the far-right parties winning elections in India and Argentina and Brazil, what's been called the conservative wave or the blue tide, as well as right-wing movements in the UK and the US, what with Brexit and Trump and all that. And she looks at the radical movements that kicked off the 2010s as well. The Arab Spring, the Occupy Movement, Rojava, BLM. And she states, As this book is nearing completion, the world has seen another wave of action akin to the struggles of 2011. As Chile, Iraq, Iran, Lebanon, Argentina, Jordan, India, Indonesia, Colombia, Bolivia, Kazakhstan, Ecuador, Hong Kong, Puerto Rico, and Hawaii have all had massive uprisings, many verging on revolutionary upheavals. And in the United States, alongside the struggles in Puerto Rico and Hawaii, the historical hashtag no DAPL pipeline struggle, the largest prison strike in American history, the generalization of militant anti-fascism, the anti-ICE movement, and the movement that directly gave rise to this book, the anti-police uprisings of the movement for black lives. And Osterweil argues that the folks on the left must stop disavowing rioting and property destruction and looting, and instead we should recognize that rioting and looting can be an effective political tactic. And she ends the text stating, Knowledge of the armed aspect of rioting should no longer be kept in shameful secret, but instead should be understood and celebrated as action directly in line with self-defense movements of the black tradition, from the Underground Railroad to the anti-lynching defense forces to the armed participants in the Southern Freedom Movement. We need to stand fast beside looters, rioters, and street fighters and struggle with them against the liberal commentators, de-escalators, non-profiteers, right-wing trolls, vigilantes, and, of course, the police. Conclusion I believe Osterweil's overall argument for the text is contained within, well, the quote that I just read at the end of the book, but also the following quote about halfway into the text, where she states, we have to stop thinking of a riot, which, after all, encompasses so many different functions, from sports celebrations to overthrow of a regime, as an easily grasped and unified concept. 
If we learn to pay attention to the content, tactics, and actions contained within them, we can learn not to dismiss, misunderstand, or reject moments of possibility for revolutionary change and start to think and strategize about how to move toward that horizon. And as an anarcho-communist, this is a sentiment that I totally agree with. But there is one small problem. Outside of straight-up anarchists and radical activists, I don't think we're going to get the general public to view riots and looting in this way anytime soon. I've said it a million times. Protests, like all political action, are about raising costs. If you want to raise the minimum wage or start a union or stop a war, or pass a law or a regulation or end capitalism, you must make it so that those with the power to make changes, those who are benefiting from the status quo, feel the cost of maintaining that status quo. You must raise the cost so that continuing the course is more expensive to them, more costly to them, than making the changes you desire. And although I admit that looting is a wonderful destruction of the commodity form, a way to focus on use value rather than the exchange value of items in society, a way to provide goods to people, I think at this particular time, it's an optical lost cause. Books like Politics is for Power discuss a lot of the electoral power that is left on the table by town halls and city governments and the like. That's power that folks should be wielding as activists. And I get it. Marching and waving banners is kind of boring and defeatist and doesn't seem to be getting us anywhere. So looting seems more effective than that. And to that I say, yeah, marching and waving banners probably isn't the most effective non-electoral means of solving our problems. To that end, I'd recommend the book Rules for Radicals, which talks about creative solutions for political action outside of bog-standard marches and protest signs. Okay, so now you're thinking, rad, you think political activists aren't doing enough in regards to electoral power at the local level, and they aren't doing enough creative tactics for non-electoral action, and you think rioting and looting is a lost cause optically. Why the hell did you review this book? Do you recommend it or not? What the hell, dude? Well, to that I'd say, I think the arguments in this book are still important. I look at it this way. Do you remember the arguments a while back around whether or not it was okay to punch Richard Spencer? People were like, no, it's wrong, because people shouldn't be punched for voicing their ideas, even if those are <clears throat> Nazi ideas, because that's illiberal. Or it's okay to punch people for being Nazis, but we shouldn't do it because that gives them undeserved attention and sympathy. Or it is okay to punch people for being Nazis, and we should do it. Optically, it makes us look stronger than them, and we can share around memes about how they're losers who deserve a good punching. Or even, it is okay to punch people for being Nazis, and we should do it, even if that does give them undeserved attention and sympathy. Well, that's how I look at rioting and looting. People act predictable given their circumstances, and rioting and looting is going to occur in a society with stark inequality, where some folks have more than they could ever need, while many are barred from those same goods, all while being mocked by those goods from behind store windows, sitting unused, because those who want those items lack the exchange value to have them. Understood in its proper context, rioting and looting can be seen as a radical political act. Sure, it can be an optical loss in a few different ways. Maybe we're falling for agent provocateurs. Maybe we throw the rioters and looters under the bus to appeal to liberal critiques or conservative attacks. I don't know. But we can and should do as this book does and defend the looting, give it proper context. Speaking of defending looting, let's look back at the two goals on the cover of the text that I talked about in the intro to the video. Does this book give a defense of looting? And does it provide a riotous history of looting? It does okay. I think if you sat down a conservative and with them followed the thread from slaves looting themselves to workers and citizens looting the fruits of their labor, they would agree that there is a thread there, even if they totally disagree with the tactics, motives, and everything else. But sadly, I don't think this book is going to convince any folks who don't already agree with it. For one thing, it's full of charged framing and politically loaded terms that will turn away most readers. For example, Passages like, This spike in violence reflects an attempt to reconstitute cis-heteropatriarchal white supremacist capitalism in the face of numerous threats to its dominance. Or, We need to argue for and defend every tactic that might help us overturn this miserable world of white supremacy, anti-blackness, cis-heteropatriarchy, capitalism, empire, and property. 
And I know that terms like cis-heteronormative and hegemony and colonialism, they have important meanings and they have a place in discussing ideas. I just don't think that a book about defending looting and providing context for looting is the place for language that's going to turn people away. People that we could convince by making the exact same arguments, but with more strategic language. I mean, just look at all the one-star reviews that this book has from conservative chuds who probably didn't even read one page of it. And I'm not saying that all of these folks could be won over. I think that the massive review bombing would have happened given the subject matter, no matter how the book was written. But I think that looting could have been defended in such a way that a lot of these folks could be convinced. If I were to defend looting to a normie or even a conservative, I'd talk about runaway slaves and the great unrest of 1877 and Watts and all that, but I'd also talk about the Boston Tea Party and the looting of America from the British and Shays' Rebellion and probably more examples from the radical labor movement and maybe even that Clive Bundy standoff story. Just give more examples that give a more generally defensible history of looting that could connect with the average American. Not that there is such a thing, you get what I'm saying. Given that more well-rounded explanation, I think most Americans could understand that when it comes to raising social costs, to pushing for change in society, sometimes letter-writing campaigns are enough, candlelight vigils and marches are enough, and sometimes the motivations against change are so strong that the only way to get those radical demands met is through the destruction of the system, through ignoring social conventions around capital ownership, commodities, and the private expropriation of socially produced goods. I guess what I mean to say is that I recommend reading this book if you're a leftist and you want a more concrete grasp of this history or a nicely constructed way of conveying this history to others. I just don't think that I could give this book to a conservative or even a normie and expect to have them consider looting a defensible political act. And as always, I'd like to thank my wonderful patrons. You've allowed me to support other creators I couldn't otherwise support, which I love. You've provided me with a little extra funds for books and dog toys and cans of soup and Molotov cocktails and things like that, <laughs> uh, which is really awesome, and I appreciate you folks a lot. And if you like what I do here and you want to support the show, you can go to patreon.com slash radical reviewer. And if you're interested in radical theory, looking for a book recommendation or whatever, you can get your radical reviews here with the radical reviewer. Thanks for watching. There are the protesters, there are the rioters, and there are the looters. The protesters are there because they actually care about what is happening in the community. They want to raise their voices and they are there strictly to protest. You have the rioters who are angry, who are anarchists, who really just want to <laughs> shit up, and that's what they're going to do regardless. And then you have the looters. And the looters almost exclusively are just there to do that, to loot. Now, people are like, well, what did you gain? Well, what did you get from looting? I think that as long as we're focusing on the what, we're not focusing on the why, and that's my issue with that. As long as we're focusing on what they're doing, we're not focusing on why they're doing. And some people are like, well, those aren't people who are legitimately angry about what's happening. Those are people who just want to get stuff. Okay, well then, let's go with that. Let's say that's what it is. Let's ask ourselves why in this country in 2020, the financial gap between poor blacks and the rest of the world is at such a distance that people feel like their only hope and only opportunity to get some of the things that we flaunt and flash in front of them all the time is to walk through a broken glass window and get it.